So, uh, so it's awesome to be here. Hey, I want to share with you a scripture and a message this morning. And this message is a, it's a simple message. And I want to preach, preach about the gospel. How crazy is that? If I say the gospel, <laughs> you might think, well, the gospel's for people who don't know Christ. Well, it is, but the gospel is just, a mess, just as much a message to the church. It amazes me how many Christians don't know the gospel. How many Christians don't know what the gospel is? They know Christ, but what is this message? And, and I want to declare this morning across this church and across this city that Jesus has come. The kingdom of God has come. And, and Jesus has come and he's done the work. He's accomplished all that he needs to accomplish. And, if we, and this morning I want to talk about all that Christ has done, which is the message of the gospel, which is, which is awesome. And the power of that gospel and what it's done for our lives, which is a wonderful thing. Hey, uh, and as I was sharing before, I just wanted to, you know, uh, say it again. Uh, just a little bit about our family. We've uh, got three kids. Uh, our youngest daughter and her husband have three little girls, and they live in Sydney. And we've got two children that live in New York, and they've also they're also married, and they have three uh, sons between them. Uh, so I've got three grandsons in New York and three granddaughters in Sydney, uh, and and grandparenthood is a great stage great stage of life and uh, and they're all following Christ they're all in church and what have you just the power of Christ coming into a family is a powerful thing don't underestimate the power of that and here's a great thing it accumulates speed and momentum as the generations progress so we're watching even our little grandkids begin to grow up in church and I know I can see the call of God on them as, as they're in church which is a wonderful thing so keep praying for your families keep believing for them because it's a it's a wonderful thing when the when life and eternity and grace comes into a family that seed of Christ gets into a family and everything's different from that point on which is awesome hey come on let's give Jesus a big hand for all he's doing in your family and look if you're the first person in your family to come to Christ and you're the only family member, then I pray for you that you would stay strong and stay and hang in there because God will redeem and he will turn every situation around for God's glory. Who believes that? Anyone? Yeah, you believe that. Okay. All right. Let me share a passage of scripture with you and, and just share for a few moments over this next this amazing passage, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, verse 1, says this, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. I love the fact that it says that the tax collectors and sinners were attracted to Jesus, that they were drawn to him. And I believe the measure of a church, the, the measure of the, of the power of a church, the measure of the effectiveness of a church is how well it attracts people who don't know God. And it's not how well it attracts religious people, it's how well it attracts people who actually don't know Christ. And so the sinners and the tax collectors were attracted to Jesus. I love that. And it, I find it interesting that it says it separates sinners and tax collectors. Isn't it interesting? Anybody find that fascinating? It, 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 it makes a special note of the tax collectors because every generation has tax collectors. They may not be tax collectors, but every generation has a particular group of people that the church rejects. And, and I believe the church, we need to, the very people we need to be attracting is the, is the very group of people that most people don't want to be around. The tax collectors were hated. And they were the very ones that are attracted to Jesus. And Jesus included them. In fact, not only did he include them, he ate with them. Oh, God forbid. <laughs> he had actually, he ate with them. And, and the church is called to give, the church is called to be hospitable. The church is called to love people and to connect with people. And because it's through, ultimately, it's the heart of love. And it's the heart, that's what makes Christianity different. It, 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 is, it is not about the doctrine. 
It is not about the religious services. It is about the heart of a believer that makes us different. And it's that heart of the believer that carries the love of Christ and so on. And then it says, and then it says, uh, and then the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled. Religious people grumble. Religious people are not happy people. They're never happy. You can never please them. But, but godly people, Christian people, are happy people. They're the happiest people on the earth. Amen. Who believes that, anyone? We're the, we're the fun crowd. We're the smiling crowd, the, the loving crowd. We're, we're making a difference in the earth, which is awesome. And Jesus gathered them and had meals with them and there was party and life and joy and celebration. And the, and the religious people were like, who are those happy people? We do. He gr they grumbled at the Son of God. Imagine the Messiah himself being in your midst and you still couldn't see him. You still couldn't recognize him and still couldn't recognize what he did. So Jesus goes, I think I'll tell a story. When, when Jesus had something to say, he didn't teach doctrine. When Jesus had something to say, he told a story. So he told them this parable. And, this is, and the parable is, the, is in three parts. And we know, we've probably heard it before. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. So he tells a parable. And we're going to cover that quickly in the next few minutes. So I'm just going to read this first few verses. And he says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance." What a great story. I love the fact that it, he talks about when he finds that sheep. And of course, that sheep represents you and I. Yeah. The, and the shepherd represents Jesus. Jesus left the comfort of heaven to come and find you and me. And here's the deal. If you were the only person on earth, if you were the only one that needed finding, he would have come to find you. And he doesn't just see the multitudes, he sees the individual. He, he doesn't just see the masses of people through Southeast Asia and Asia and Australia and America. He sees you. As you said, Pastor Clarence, he knows your name. And he would have left heaven to find you. And when he found you, he, I love it, he puts you on his shoulders. <laughs> he does the carrying. It's only by grace that we get here. Not by our own works. He does the carrying. We're on his shoulders with his little sheep and hanging over the shoulders of Jesus. And he takes us and he rejoices and he has a party. There's another party. And they rejoice. I have this little theory that, because it talks about there's a heaven rejoices every time one returns. So that means that heaven has an event organizer. <laughs> Imagine being the event organizer in heaven, saying another one has come to Christ. Quick, another party. And then so, so do you realize that 81,000 people, I believe it's 81,000 people an hour are coming to Christ around the world? That's a lot of parties. Imagine the poor event organizer in heaven. And, and, but the thing is, heaven is rejoicing. Heaven rejoiced when you came to Christ. Heaven rejoiced this morning when others will, will come to a knowledge of God and begin their journey of faith, which is awesome. So Jesus did this. So it represents this first part of the parable, the story, represents what Jesus did. He left heaven, came to earth, and achieved the gospel and be declared the good news. And all we need to do is believe it. And God does the rest. How amazing. Here's my statement for this morning. Jesus has done it all. There is nothing you can do, nothing you're able to do, nothing you should do. He has done it all. Come on, that deserves a hand right now. He's done it all. All right. So just in the next few minutes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Here's, here's what I've discovered. Many Christians don't know what Jesus has done. They have a vague idea. He, he died on something and 
and, and got us forgiveness or something. Isn't that sort of, yeah, I think that's good. Well, I believe we need to know what it is that Jesus did. Jesus did five things, five things in 50 days that changed the world. Who would like to know what they are? Yeah. Most of you, three of you. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, let's, we're going to go. We're going to go to the movies. Okay, all sort of the movies. Still screen. If we can just pull up that first screen there, that'd be great. Okay, the first thing that Jesus did was the cross. Thank God for the cross. Thank God for the cross. And in the cross, we see the suffering Christ. But, but what do we get in the cross? Forgiveness. Who needs forgiveness? <laughs> we, can't, we can't get entrance to the gospel unless we know that all of our forgiveness comes through the cross. And not only, and so the greatest ailment of humanity, the greatest struggle of the human soul is guilt and shame. I used to be a social worker and work with people on a regular basis, families, couples, individuals. And the number one thing that plagued the human soul was guilt and shame. But the only antidote, the only answer to guilt and shame is the cross. Because the, the cross gives us access back into God's acceptance, presence, favor, and of course, ultimately his forgiveness. And we now have forgiveness. That's great news. Say this after me. I am forgiven. But not only does the cross, watch this, provide the power to forgive. Not only does it provide the power to forgive you, it provides the power for you to forgive others. So not only do we have vertical reconnection with God, I'm forgiven by God, but the cross also is a horizontal part of the cross. He gives us power to forgive others. And in the forgiving of others, not only is our relationship with God healed, my relationship with others is healed. So my family is restored. My, my business partnerships are restored. Friendships so one of the greatest things, that, well, the greatest thing that breaks down relationships is unforgiveness. Where's the answer? The cross. We need to be carrying the cross into every one of our relationships. Some of you have heard of a great preacher called T.D. Jakes from America. He says this. He says, forgiveness is like breathing. As we breathe in forgiveness from God, we breathe out forgiveness to others. And if you break the cycle, it's a closed circuit. And if you stop forgiving others, you can't breathe in forgiveness from God. You can't keep breathing in without breathing out. Try it. <laughs> You'll explode. <laughs> you have to exhale. God has called us to be forgiven, but called us to forgive. God has called us to be forgiven and called us to forgive. It's a, it's a constant cycle. And Matthew chapter 6, it's the only thing that Jesus repeated in the Lord's Prayer and said, if you do not forgive your brother who offends you, God in heaven will not forgive you your sins. And so forgiveness, why are countries at war? Why are families breaking down? Why are races against each other? Why are friendships breaking up? The lack of the cross. As we forgive others, I'm telling you, it brings the kingdom. It brings the gospel. The gospel isn't just what it does for me. The gospel is what it does to me for others. It is so important. That's the gospel. I could preach on this all day. It's so powerful, the forgiveness, the cross. But wait, there's more. What's beyond the cross? We go to the next one. Thank you. Is the burial. Many Christians don't realize or don't know where Jesus went. Where did Jesus go? Well, he went from the cross. He went in. He didn't just disappear for three days. He actually went to hell. The Bible says he went to hell and he preached to the demons. He, what did he preach? A message of salvation? No. What did he preach to the demons? He preached a message of victory over them. He, met, he preached defeat to them on our behalf. So in the burial, he's a victorious Christ. He preached defeat to your enemies on our behalf. Hey, we've got a great Jesus, haven't we? Yeah. Defeat to what? What are our enemies? Fear, anxiety, depression, oppression, discouragement, all the things that plague the human soul. Jesus says, I'm going to win a victory over them. And ultimately, the ultimate thing was death. 
And he preached victory on our behalf and defeat to them. Praise God for the burial. Amen. But wait, there's more. Where did Jesus go? He rose from the dead. The next one, resurrection, new life, the risen Christ. Now, many Christians, well, most all Christians celebrate Easter. But often we, we celebrate Easter like it's a, a piece of history only. Of course it was a piece of history. Many Christians celebrate Easter like it's a piece of, of religious truth. It is a piece of religious truth. But even more important than that, the resurrection is, represents what God did for you and what you are actually there. In fact, Romans chapter 6, it says that we were with him when he died. In other words, our old life, our sin nature was with Christ. But we were also with Christ when he raised him from the dead. We were actually in the resurrection, your new life. We now have a new life in Christ. In the cross, not in the cross, watch this. Not only is Christianity about what we've been saved from, Christianity is about what we've been saved to. What has he saved you to? New life, new vision, new purpose. That marriage that you think is dead, that vision that you think is dead, that business that you think is dead, he's the deal. We serve a resurrected God and that resurrection life lives on the inside of you. You have resurrection on the inside of you. I think I'll just start jumping up and down right now. That's, that's amazing news. You might think, well, I don't, I feel pretty, you know, whatever, pretty dead on the inside. Well, I'll tell you, you get to know Christ and new life lives on the inside of you. This isn't just theology. This is reality. You need new life to pick you up of a morning. You need new life to keep you going. To God has a vision for you. You might think, well, I'm just a believer in Jesus. No, you're more than that. God has called you individually to a purpose and a destiny that is far greater than you can imagine. And it's discovered in the resurrection life of God, which is awesome. Okay, but wait, there's more. Beyond the resurrection is what? Hang on, the ascension. I don't know about you, I love reading the Gospels, the four accounts of the Gospel, because it talks about all the great things that Jesus did. And he, he rose from the dead and he didn't just disappear straight away. He thought, I'll hang around for 40 days. So Jesus hung around for 40 days, teaching the disciples, scaring the disciples. <laughs> he'd walk through walls and disappear and they'd be talking about him and he'd go, hey guys, and just appear. He loves Jesus. He's awesome. He'd be cooking fish on the shore for them. Yep. How awesome is that? Yeah. They're hungry. So he's, they go, who's that on the shore? And they go, it's Jesus. He's cooking fish. <laughs> he's like, he wants to hang out with his buddies, which is awesome. But the ascension. But, but he hung around. He taught them, talked to them about what was coming. They still didn't get it. They still didn't get it. And then one day, after 40 days, he says to them, hey, guys, I'm going. And... Right in front of their eyes, as they were watching, he disappears, floats into the sky, up and through the clouds, physically. They just watched him go, just like this. I bet they couldn't see that coming this, that morning as they were having breakfast. Jesus disappears right in front of them, and it says two angels appeared on either side of them. I have a, I have a little theory that these angels were from New York. You know why? Because in the text, the words that the angel said, the exact phrase that they said was this. They said to the disciples, what are you looking at? <laughs> Come on, who believes me? Anyone? That, that, that's what it says in the text. Only a New Yorker would say it like that. You know? Hey, what are you looking at? So the two angels said to the disciples, what are you looking at? In other words, stop looking at where he's gone. Now get on with it. Yeah. Start preaching the gospel out into the community. But where did Jesus go? So can I grab this chair? Okay, where did Jesus go? It says that Jesus ascended. Everyone say ascended. ascended. But where, ascended where? He ascended and it says he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When someone sits down, it means, when someone sits down, it means they're finished. Like the work's done. He, and Jesus is going, I'm done. The work's over. 
The moment you try to prove yourself, the moment you think that your religion or your Christianity is something that you have to prove God, you've lost the point of the gospel. The point of the gospel is Jesus has done it all. And it says he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So God the Father's here. Sorry. God the Father's here. <laughs> and Jesus is here. And it says that the Father placed all things in subjection to Jesus. All authority, all power, all dominion, the whole earth, everything under his feet. Everything. That's awesome. This isn't just a piece of poetic writing. This is reality. That's in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 2 says that we too are seated with Christ. Wait a minute. Think about this. We too are seated with Christ. We were in the, we were in, we were on the cross. We were in the burial. We were on the resurrection. But we are also seated with Christ in heavenly places. Years ago, 1983, I was at college, C3 College, graduates from college right here as well. And it was a pretty tough year. We had two small children at that point, and we had no money. You know that deal. I should have got a prophecy like you, and then I would have been okay. And I remember, I remember praying this particular day in the, in the house that we were renting. And I was praying, and it wasn't a good praying. It was, God, oh God, God help us, help us through. God, God, God. It's, who's ever prayed prayers like that with, that with that sound? You know, like a whingy, whiny, complaining sound. And I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, what are you doing? And I said to the Lord, I'm praying. And I felt the Holy Spirit goes, it doesn't sound much like it up here. <laughs> so I felt inspired to get on the bench. So I got on the bench and this scripture in Ephesians chapter 2, 7 came to me immediately. It said, you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And he said to, this to me, stop praying from under your problems. Pray from above your problems because I have placed authority in your hands, if you only knew how much authority you have, begin to pray from a position of completed authority rather than underneath the thing. How crazy is that? Most Christians are praying. Watch this. Most Christians, because they don't know the gospel, are praying about their problems instead of speaking to their problems. God wants you to speak to your problem. Jesus never prayed for the sick. He never prayed for the sick. He healed the sick. He never won. When a sick person came to Jesus, he never said, God, Father, heal them. Every time he'd say, be healed. What do you need to speak to? Because you need to understand the ascension, the heavenly Christ. What circumstances are you in right now? Poverty, joblessness depression, confusion, speak to that problem. I dare you this afternoon to get, don't do it in the mall. <laughs> don't do it, do it privately in the privacy of your home, in the privacy of your prayer closet and begin to speak to your problems and your situations and say, I declare in the name of Jesus that this situation will break through. And I declare, I can tell you, God has given you authority. Okay, but there's more. Beyond that, the next thing is the dissension. Jesus, the Father and Jesus colluded. It was the first collab. And they said, we need, to send, we need to send the third party of the Trinity. We can't leave these guys alone. So they sent the Holy Spirit. And you know the story in Acts chapter 2. While they were in the upper room praying, it says the Holy Spirit came and filled them with power. Because we don't just need authority, we need power. You need power to keep your life alive in God. 
You can't do this in your own emotional power. You can't do this in your own mental power. You need the power of the Holy Spirit that gives you boldness, that gives you clarity, that gives you anointing, that helps you run your business, that helps you keep married, that helps you do life well. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Okay. Because here's the deal. And, you know, Jesus went on and talked about the next parable, the next part of the parable, which is the parable of the lost coin. I won't spend a lot of time on this. I've got to finish. But, but he talked about the lost coin. And it's interesting that the, the sheep was lost in the field, but the coin was lost in the house. People often get saved, in, saved and come to Christ, come to church, and then get lost in church. As we travel churches all over the world, People, are, 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 they're saved, they're going to heaven, but they're lost in church. And the coin fell on the floor in the house. And then, so you think, how can there be lost people in church? Well, I, I've come up with a few categories of lost people in church. Some people who just, in church, they've been in church longer than Noah. <laughs> Not this Noah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, more than five weeks, that's right. Yeah. But they're, they're meeting in church forever. And they, when they first joined the church, they were on fire. They were joining every team, they were volunteering everything. Then after a while, it's like, oh, I'm so bored with this. And they just have become passive in their Christianity. And their purpose is lost. Their heart is lost. Their engagement is lost. The second type of people who are getting lost in church is offended people. People have been hurt by the church or hurt by leadership or offended at God. And you're sitting there, you haven't lost engagement, you've lost heart. And God wants to help you recover your heart again so that your heart is beating again with love and faith and grace and mercy. And if someone's offended you, if I've offended you, I'm sorry. But overcome that offense so that you can be alive again in God. Who would like that, anyone? A third type of person who's been sitting there is people who've, come, who've been coming to church for years and never received Christ. They're coming because they think it's their religious duty. But they've actually never discovered a personal relationship with Christ. And the fourth type of lost people in church is young people. Young people. People who, whose parents, thank God for their parents, their parents brought them to church. But those young people have to discover Christ for themselves. There's no secondhand relationships in God. God has no grandchildren. He has no grandchildren, only children. And if you're here and your parents brought you to church, first of all, thank God for your parents. But God wants to take you on a personal journey of discovering Christ for yourself. Our kids, all of, us, our, all of our kids were born in church, not physically in the, in the sanctuary. Our son Joshua, who's a pastor now in Brooklyn, New York, he's got a church of 2,000 people in Brooklyn. He was the first baby born in C3. The first one. And I remember as a young kid, him growing up, and I remember as a four-year-old, I'm driving home from church and my son was four. There's the two of us in the car. Halfway home, Josh says to me, Dad, I think I, re I need to receive Christ. I'm like, really? You're a four-year-old. <laughs> so I thought, I pulled the car over, turned off the ignition. And I thought, I'm not going to miss this opportunity. And we prayed a prayer for him to receive Christ. We prayed the sinner's prayer. And you know, he's only four, but... That list of sins was very long. <laughs> if you know any four-year-olds, you know how much mischief they can get up to. But he, it was a genuine encounter with God, not through me, but to Christ. He, did, he got baptized at 11 and recommitted his life again when he was maybe 15 or 16. And now he's in ministry. I'm telling you, young people, God wants to know you. God wants to know there's a calling on your life. It's not secondhand, it's directly. It's interesting, the woman who, who lost the coin. Back in those days, when a woman was preparing for her wedding, she would collect 10 coins and sew them to a headpiece. And she would wear that headpiece on her wedding day. 
And that headpiece represented a covenant between her and her, her husband. And it represents a covenant between the church and Christ. And when one coin fell off the headpiece and onto the floor, she stopped everything until she found that coin. When one life is lost in church, we need to find that life. It isn't just getting them into church, it's getting them into Christ. It's getting them into the purpose of God. Every life counts. And she did three things. She lit a lamp, swept the floor, and searched until. We need to light the lamps again in our churches. We need to get the Word of God alive in our churches. We, we, need, to, we need to see the anointing, the presence of God back in our churches. Because the moment that is in our churches, we see people. Because maybe the person next to you is one of these lost coins who's just coming along to church, going through the motions. And I'm telling you, they will not survive unless they're found. And so she swept the floor. I remember reading this scripture years ago thinking, sweep the floor? How hard can it be to find a coin? You know, you drop a coin on the floor, you look under the couch, there it is. Back in those days, the floors were covered in 20 centimetres of straw to keep the floors dry. So she had to empty the whole floor of like half a ton of straw to find this one coin. Straw in the New Testament represents the dead works of man. It represents the things that will burn up in, in, the, in the judgment of God. We need to sweep our church floors of empty religion, things that don't matter, and get back to the basics of preaching the word, the worship of God, and the love of people. And when we do that, we'll see people suddenly do you have Super Mario here, the old, the old video game? Remember the coins? You know, suddenly all these coins will start popping up and we'll begin to see lives again, which is awesome. And it's interesting, the, the last part of the parable, Jesus tells it. So he says, he talks about the lost coin in the house. And I believe if you're here this morning and, and you're feeling a little bit disengaged or disaffected or disconnected, God's going to recover your life. Because I'm telling you, Destiny C3 needs, needs your gifting, needs your calling. We've got a whole nation to reach here, which is awesome. Then got, Jesus tells the last part of the story, lost son. And we always talk about the prodigal son. The, by the way, it's, in the Bible, it never uses the word prodigal which means wasteful and extravagant. But that son left, and you know the story, and eventually came to his senses and returned to the father, returned to the father's house. I love that. I love the fact that the father was looking from afar. When you and I came back to God, the father was looking from afar, and he ran towards us, not with a baseball bat <laughs> or a knife or a gun, but with the arms open. Thank God for a loving father, right? And he, the Father is always on the balcony of heaven looking for your return. The Father is never in judgment. We live in an age of grace and God's the Father is looking out for you. No matter where you're from, if you're here this morning and you're new and you don't feel qualified, you don't feel like you're accepted, I'm telling you, in Christ, the God the Father is accepting you right now. But then there was an older brother. The older brother represents the church. The older brother didn't even know that the younger brother returned hardly and complained when the father had a party. And he'd lost the sound of celebration. He'd lost the heart of, of, of reaching out to the young. It's interesting that all the, the other two stories, somebody went to find the lost thing. But in this story, no one went to find the lost brother because it was the older brother's job to leave the house and go and find the younger brother. Because it's the Father's job to receive, but it's the church's job to rescue. It's our job to rescue. We're, our job is to leave this church service and to find people that need rescuing and then bring them to the house next weekend. And the, guess who's here waiting? Sure, the pastors, but more importantly, the Father. The Father is here waiting. It is, we are the older brothers. We are the older sisters. It's our job to go out, and I'm telling you, you will see people. You will see people that need rescuing. And, and, and this crowd will be doubled, tripled, quadrupled, times 10, times 11, times 50, times because it's our job to begin to do that. 
and begin to rescue people. And we'll see Malaysia affected by God and turned around by God in Jesus. Now, who believes that? Anyone? Amen. Amen. God is good. God is good. God is good. Can we stand to our feet as we finish right now? Holy Spirit. Who liked hearing about the gospel this morning? That's the gospel. The good news of Christ. Amen.